The Best of Our Knowledge explores topics on learning, education, and research. Coming up, hairy bodies, compound eyes, feather-like antenna. The perhaps misunderstood moth is in the limelight in the experimental documentary film The Night Visitors. The movie provides a glimpse into a world many of us overlook. We'll speak with filmmaker Michael Gitlin. I'm Lucas Willard, host of The Best of Our Knowledge. This is the best of our knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. Okay, I had to face some fears for this next segment. Today's show is about moths, or it's about a movie about moths. New York-based filmmaker Michael Gitlin is the director of The Night Visitors. The 2023 film is about creatures that are often overlooked. The Night Visitors offers stunning photography of the insects from larvae to adults, the moth's feather-like antenna, colorful wings, and teddy bear-like fur are captured in extraordinary detail. But beyond capturing the beauty and strangeness of these animals, The Night Visitors also explores themes of presence and mortality. The film carries an environmental message, too, exploring an ill-fated experiment to capitalize on American silk more than a century ago that created an ecological disaster we are still grappling with. The Night Visitors is presented in a unique, experimental style. Think David Attenborough meets David Lynch. To learn more, I spoke with Michael Gitlin. I mean, it's really the style of of all my films. I make, um, I think, what you could call experimental documentaries. Um, and um, I love those kind of, you know, like a nature film, like a David Attenborough film, but it's not the kind of film that I would make or really even could make. Um I uh, often think of a quote from a filmmaker that I, I like a great deal, uh, a narrative filmmaker, uh, Robert Bresson, the French filmmaker, um, who's got a little book of uh, aphorisms called Notes on the Cinematographer that's really great. And he says, uh, make visible that which without you would never be seen. Um, and so that's, you know, I sort of think of that as a way of, of thinking about how do you make a film? You make a film that makes visible the thing that if you didn't make that film, it wouldn't be seen. Um, and so that sort of feeds into that style, that sort of, as you say, impressionistic or um, somewhat experimental style. And I think that that aphorism, making visible um, what without you would never be seen, um, is maybe particularly apt for this film um, because it's this little world, this kind of hidden world um, that most people don't know about um, that's really just in your own backyard. About 200 species of moths have appeared at the lights in my backyard. With a bit more persistence or ambition, it would be possible to see more than a thousand species there. So the insects that are featured in the film, you have close-up shots, and they're incredibly visually interesting. They're, you know, you think of the luna moth and the feather-like antenna and there's this fur that looks like it's a pet it looks like a my cat <laughs> and and you wouldn't see this without this kind of photography so is that something that you deliberately wanted before you even started the film is zoom in on a creature that in a lot of cases is unnoticed or ignored yeah totally i i I mean, I maybe I might back up a, uh, a step and and sort of talk for a moment about where the film came from or how I started the film because it sort of leads into that. Um, I, speaking of luna moths, I got in my head that I wanted to see a luna moth. I'd never seen one. I'd seen pictures of them, um, and you know, I just I think this is a number of years ago because I've been working. I worked on the film for quite a few years, um, and I just thought, well, you know, how do I see that? How do I see a luna moth? And I. Um, did some research about how people attract moths to light. How do you put up a mothing sheet? And um, and uh, and so then I did that. And um, you know, the, within the first time or two that I started attracting moths to light, 
this sort of world opened up in front of me that I just had no idea existed. Most of the film was shot in my backyard. A little bit of it was shot up at McDowell um, in uh, the artist residency up in New Hampshire, uh, but almost all of it was shot in my backyard in Tivoli, New York. And, um, you know, it's like, so if you live in the Hudson Valley or live really, really wherever you live, uh, if you have a backyard and a light, you can see these things that are just kind of amazing. I think most people think of moths as being um, these little, you know, nondescript brown pests. And so to see just the range of um, kind of beauty and, as you say, that some of them are, are look have what almost looks like fur, although, of course, it's not fur, it's scales, but um, um, just that that beauty is kind of w- was overwhelming to me. You have title cards that appear throughout the film, and I'm going to quote one that uh, appears. <laughs> you wrote, it's 2.30 in the morning. No one else is awake. I don't know if I'm talking to myself or to the moths. I'm becoming old and strange, and I worry that moths are part of my retreat from people. Can you explain? <laughs> that sounds very serious when you say it that way. Um, usually when the film shows, it a, gets a little bit of a laugh. But, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that was, w- was going on when I um, started working on the film, so I said I talked about how I wanted to see a Luna Moth. The other sort of um, thread that I was following was um, I was getting a, older, and as I think as often happens to people when they get a bit older, I started having really bad middle insomnia. Um, you know, I was able to go to sleep, but I would wake up in the middle of the night, and when you have middle insomnia, you kind of lay there and stare at the ceiling and have thoughts about mortality and things like that. And so I thought, well, let me get out of bed and do something active. And and um, and so that was part of the impulse to stay up late and moth. But when you're up in your backyard or wherever you are uh, as a mothing sheet. Um, for me, it was it's a rather solitary activity. Um, unlike uh, bird watching, which I'm also a bird person, um, unlike bird watching, which there's a lot more bird watchers than there are moth people, um, you know, you do that. I often would do that in groups. With mothing, it was always just me and the sheet and the moths. Um, and so, you know, that does feel very solitary, uh, and I did often feel like uh, when I would be talking uh, to the moths, I wasn't quite sure if I was talking to myself or to the moths. Yeah. Well, also with insects who live such shorter lives than humans, yeah. especially with moths and butterflies, yeah. you see their entire life cycle within totally. a matter. I mean, everyone remembers hatching caterpillars maybe in their elementary school classroom yeah. and you see it turn into uh, a pupa or a chrysalis yeah. and then the the adult emerges so in thoughts of in life and in, in mortality and do you see an overlap yeah do you see an overlap with your study of moths and insects totally totally i mean you can't as you say you can't help but but think think about that um I mean, as part of the film, um, you may have noticed that there's a spine or a thread that runs through the film. Um, uh, I raise uh, Cecropia moths, which are the largest moths in North America, these really big, beautiful moths, uh, a native silk moth. And um, I got some eggs and then, you know, raised them through each of the different, um, it's called instars, the different stages of the caterpillars. Um, and it was a really a tremendous amount of work. I had to go out many times a day and get uh, maple leaves for them. And I got super, super attached to them. I mean, they became like my babies, like my pets or, or, or my friends even. Um, uh, we went on vacation that summer. Uh, this is the summer of 2019. We went on vacation that summer, and I, had, I was raising them in these big plastic buckets, and we took the plastic buckets with us on vacation. So I Where could, did you go on vacation? Uh, well, we went up to New Hampshire, uh, where my um, partner's family is from. Uh, um, luckily, we didn't fly anywhere. That would have been a problem. But uh, So, um, you know, I just, I, you know, it was, again, a lot of work. And then at the end of that season, um, they all 
the Cecropia, uh, fifth instar Cecropia caterpillars all wove cocoons, which was great. And I, my idea had been, you know, when you make a film like this, a sort of, um, as you called it, impressionistic or experimental organic kind of film, um, you're always thinking about, like, what is the spine or the thread that I can use to weave the whole thing together? And I knew pretty early, or at least I knew at that point, I thought maybe, well, I'll raise these cecropias and then I'll keep coming back to them throughout their life cycle and that will be like a thread for the film um and um so I raised them and they wove their co- their wove their cocoons and I thought oh well that's fantastic you know um I got that really great looking footage of each stage of their lives and I I didn't think um, you know, I put them in my shed uh, to overwinter because they have to overwinter when it, where it's cold. If you if they overwinter inside, they'll ha- they'll it close. It's called they'll hatch out too early. Um, so I put them in my shed, and I thought, well, that was the end of that. And then the next spring, spring of twenty twenty, the uh, COVID spring, um, uh, you know, one warm late May day. Um, I, I brought them out and set them on a picnic table in the sun and they started, they started to closing, they started hatching out. It was really the most unbelievable thing. One of the most unbelievable things I've I've ever experienced. One of the most moving things I've ever experienced. Here we are in this COVID lockdown, um, all of us in our cocoons. And then here are these guys that are just like bursting forth and, and flying away. So it was, it was really a very, um, moving experience for me. A lot of people made bread as a hobby. Oh, yeah. And I raised cat. I raised dick, uh, moths, yeah. The idea. The idea. The idea. Of the transformation. Of the transformation. Of the transformation. It all starts right there. It all starts right there. It all starts right there. How do they grow? How do they grow? Change and transform. Change and transform. Change and transform. The way that they look. Talking about the Cecropia moths, that's an important part of the film is you talk about uh, the history of what began as an experiment uh, to bring uh, silk Mm -hmm. to the United States and then what ended up in an ecological disaster that we're still seeing the effects of. Yeah. And that's a a very broad way of describing it. But uh, particularly the Cecropia moths are, are a part of that. Can you explain why you decided to go down that thread and talk about the plight of this particular moth? Is it because this is what you had on hand because they're so visually beautiful or was it because you knew of this history? Was it something you explored along the way? I didn't know the history. Um, we're talking about the um, uh, the the story of um, uh, Etienne Trouvelot, the who was a French uh, artist and amateur astronomer and amateur entomologist um, and um, took it into his head that he would try to raise uh, silk moths in um, the 18, late 1850s, 18, early 1860s. Um, and there had been a silk industry in the United States, apparently. And again, I didn't know any of this history. Had been a silk industry in the United States um, up until the 1940s when there was a speculative bubble in mulberry trees um, which burst, and then nobody raised mulberry trees anymore. And mulberry trees are the um, food stock for Bombyx mori, which is the domesticated silk moth. More common in Asia. Yeah, yeah. but they, they were imported here and were being raised here um, you know, to make a silk industry, uh, which collapsed. Uh, and so Truvelo decided he would try to figure out some other way of making silk. Um, and so he started with native... Uh, North American silk moths with the Polyphemus moth particularly. And um, and the story is um, that he thought, well, that's great, but the Polyphemus moth, um, the silk isn't really perfect for this, and maybe if I crossbreed it with some other silk moth, um, I could make a better silk. Um, and he went to Europe and looked around, and somehow he brought back um, um, a moth that we call the spongy moth now, uh, La Montre Dispar is the, the scientific name, um, and which is not a good thing to have around. Um, as, you know, I've, many people in, your, in the uh, WAMC listing area have been dealing with the spongy moth over the last number of years. Um, part of my film, I went up to um, near Lake George and met a very nice person who uh, let me film in their backyard just this devastation of the spongy moth. 
Um, and um, so um, the spongy moth got loose, started, dev- started you know, uh, devastating trees. Um, and, uh, and then in the early 1900s, people thought, well, what can we do about this? They were just spraying poison everywhere, which didn't seem to work and was obviously poisonous. Um, and so they got a, they got a um, native parasite, a parasitic fly from the spongy moss European range uh, and brought it here and let it go um, and did not work out so well. Um, so it, it did do a little bit for this, um, against the spongy moth, but not very much, um, and mostly um, attacked or uh, is, is parasitic um, on uh, native silk moths, and the scropia moth in particular, but all the native silk moths. So. It's quite a story. Yeah. And you say that Truvolo died before he saw the results of this. Yeah. Because this parasite that was brought in to control the populations was brought in by the U.S. government in the 20th century. But yeah. these experiments with Truvolo and trying to find a, a better American silk yeah. was in the 19th century. Yeah, he had gone back to France at that point. I mean, after his silk experiments uh, didn't work out, he actually had this whole other great career as a um, um, making uh, astronomical illustrations, um, which are in my film as well. And then um, at a certain point went back to France and died there in, I think, 1895 before all of this became clear. But it, it was kind of like a good, uh, you know, um, good example of the way um, people think they're figuring out how ecosystems work, but they um, often don't really know all the ramifications, all the different connection points in an ecosystem. So. Watching these moths, either the Cecropia moths, hatch and develop in your own backyard or studying this entire world of uh, creatures, you know, did this connect you more to other parts of the natural world or, or your own connection with nature itself? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've always sort of felt some, you know, um, I've always been felt some connection to um, the natural systems. Uh, as I said, I was a bird watcher before. Um, and so, yeah, I think this this increased that. Um, I, the one thing I would say uh, maybe about that is um, and uh, that I'm not a bug person, you know. <laughs> Neither like, am I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm actually, uh, and I think the film sort of talks about this a little bit um, uh, in one of those intertidal moments. Like, uh, I'm I'm actually really afraid of bugs, uh, or at least some bugs. You know, I divide my time between uh, New York City and the Hudson Valley, and in my apartment in New York City, we have those large water uh, beetles, those big cockroaches, um, which I do not like and I'm very scared of. Um, and um, so my reaction to bugs is not, you know, uh, is fear, basically, bug fear. And so it was really interesting to me to um, um, sort of find this other way of thinking about insects and being around insects um, that was not full of fear, that was, um, you know, full of awe and wonder and, and joy. Um, and um, so that that to me was kind of a revelation. Did you overcome a lot of those fears? Well, actually, I have to say that the, I mean, I never felt fear around moths. I know some people are actually, you know, phobic of moths. I've had people tell me, oh, I lo- I'd love the, to see your film, but I can't see it because I'm so scared of moths. Um, and so I, I understand that. But um, I, even from the beginning, you know, I would be in this mothing world like up to my sheet, although I, I would use a board because it photographs better than a sheet. But um, I would be up to my mothing board and there would be a cloud of um, moths around my head. And it would just be like, great, I'm just in a cloud of moths. It wouldn't be bother- It wouldn't bother me at all. If it was a cloud of some other insects, I would be freaking out. Um, so... Um, yeah, I and but I do, do sort of feel like being around moths made me somewhat less afraid of of other insects. I mean, I'm still I still don't like water beetles, but I'm not a fan of caterpillars. Oh yeah, and I was watching this yeah. documentary, and and part of me was squirming and 
my seat a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's but pretty, I stuck through it. You know, it's I, pretty like, uh, yeah, the close-ups of their mouths and the sounds and, and all of that. The number of species. The number of species is enormous. Most species rich. Most species rich organisms in the world. Other than beetles. Other than beetles. So talking about the, the sounds of yeah, the film, yeah. you have uh, original music that mm -hmm. you composed yeah. and performed, yeah. um, and you also have animations uh, that are synced in some ways to the to the music yeah. as well. What was the the vibe you were going for when you put the music together? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning um, this sort of impressionist. Oh, yeah, I think you mentioned D David Lynch at the beginning, and um, you know, in a way, it's when you make a film about insects almost inevitably it takes on a kind of science fiction aspect there's sort of a science fiction aspect to um really almost any film about insects um because they're so un they they are so unlike us and i think that's one of the things that the film grapples with and certainly one of the things that i grappled with as when i was making the film and thinking about uh, while I was making the film, while I was shooting it, you know, I'm looking at these incredibly beautiful creatures, and I have no idea what you know. When you're when you're around birds, or around your cat, you have some sense like, oh, here's a creature that I can understand, that I can can have some relationship to. But when you're around an insect, a moth, there's just no way to have a, that kind of relationship, and so that uncanniness creates a sort of science fiction vibe for me, and I think that's maybe where the music um, was going. And you also reference an Edgar Allan Poe story mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the documentary itself. Yeah, there's a, a Poe story that maybe many people will know called The Sphinx. Near the close of an exceedingly warm day, I was sitting book in hand at an open window. My thoughts had long been wandering from the volume before me to the desolation of the forsaken city. Uplifting my eyes from the page, they fell upon the distant landscape, and there, upon some living monster of hideous form. Um, that, that, like a lot of post stories, is a little hard to tell at what level of humor and horror he's kind of working. Like, there's, it seems to be pretty self conscious. It's very scary and horrible, but it also seems to be sort of self consciously jokey. Um, uh, and so, you know, I've always liked that about Poe. Poe is like, for me, I have a Poe features in a couple of other films of mine. Poe is like the one thing that unites the 12 year old me with the, the me now. Um, uh, and that story um, uh, takes place during a cholera epidemic uh, in New York. It takes place in the Hudson Valley during a cholera epidemic that was happening in New York. Um, and uh, I turned to that story and started working on that story in April of 2020, just as the pandemic was starting. Um, so I think maybe it's another way that the film intersects with the pandemic. What is the message that you want to share with the audience who is who is going to see this film? What what do you want them to come away with? Well, I think, as I said, maybe at the beginning, that it's uh, that you might come away with um, this view of this nearby world that you did not know existed. That's like a hidden that's been hidden from you in a way um, um, that if you look for it, it's right there. Um, and so that that to me, again, was a revelation to me and a surprise to me. And, and maybe I hope it would be a revelation and a surprise to the audience as well. And what's your next filmmaking project? Um, well, you know, having just finished this film and sort of playing it around at some festivals, and and um, uh, maybe I'll mention here that it's playing um, and on Thursday, April eighteenth, at the Amherst Cinema um, at seven p.m. And you can go go on their website and in Amherst, Massachusetts. In Amherst, there. Massachusetts, that's right. Um, in a in a series called Bellwether, which, I, as I understand, is free for members of the Amherst Cinema. Um, but having just finished the film and and just you know following it around and traveling with it a little bit, uh, I'm still kind of working on what I'm working on. Uh, thinking, I'm still thinking about what I'm going to be working on next. I've been 
in, in a little bit of a shift of gears from biology to maybe history. Uh, I've been reading a lot about cuneiform culture and the early history of Mesopotamia because that idea of the tran the transformation from the writing on clay to writing on paper and the sort of drop off of the information that came comes through to us in that um, transformation, um, the fact that there's all of these clay tablets preserved and then suddenly very few, there's not much paper or papyrus preserved from that same era, um, makes me think a lot about the contemporary transformation we're going through from paper to digital and what will be left you know, in the future from that. Well, I look forward to seeing that one too. Great. Thanks, Michael, so much for Thank coming you, Lucas, in. I appreciate it. Me. I really appreciate you having me, Lucas. Michael Gitlin is the filmmaker behind The Night Visitors, an experimental documentary about moths. You're listening to The Best of Our Knowledge. I'm Lucas Willard. And now a little preview of what's coming up on the next episode of The Best of Our Knowledge. The Florida Museum's Open Vertebrate Project is giving a new look at specimens tucked away in permanent collections. Using advanced 3D scan technology, the OVERT team is working to produce high-resolution anatomical data from 20,000 fluid-preserved specimens. I'll speak with the University of Florida's David Blackburn. The reality is that not everybody realizes that behind the exhibits are collections, that behind the exhibits are scientists, you know, whether or not you're an archaeologist or you're a cultural historian or you're a frog scientist, most people don't realize that behind the museum, behind the walls of the museum exhibits are people in collections. And so it's hard to bring everybody behind the scenes, right? Uh, it's crowded. <laughs> We're running out of space to put our things. We can't, can't bring millions of people behind the scenes. But being able to create these sort of realistic looking 3D models of the stuff behind the scenes means that suddenly these 3D models are in classrooms. They're in art studios. They are just being viewed by the public and a wider audience online. David Blackburn and the Florida Museum's Overt Project on the next episode of The Best of Our Knowledge. If you'd like to tell The Best of Our Knowledge what you think, send us an email at knowledge at wamc.org. You can listen to The Best of Our Knowledge anytime as a podcast, downloadable wherever you get your podcasts, and if you want to catch up on past episodes or hear more WAMC National Productions programs on the news, academic study, books, women's issues, the media, and the environment, visit wamcpodcasts.org. This has been The Best of Our Knowledge, episode 1751. The Best of Our Knowledge is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. Thanks to associate producer Jody Cowan, the latest on all national productions programs is available via the Airwaves newsletter and our flagship station's website, wamc.org. Until next time, I'm Lucas Willard.